Welcome to another episode of Candid. Today, I'm joined by the CEO of Retailability, Norman Drieselman. If you haven't heard of Retailability, you've probably heard of Edgar's, you've probably heard of Keto, as well as Legit. And these are the brands or the businesses that Retailability owns. And not to mention Boardman's, which was part of the 2020 Edgar's acquisition deal from Edcon. The takeaways that you can expect from this episode are practical in nature. Norman is very, very straightforward in how he articulates the turnaround when it came to Edgar's, together with the learnings from acquiring Legit, as well as then just what is happening behind the scenes at the Retailability Group. Norman, a massive thank you for, for joining me in the in the candid episode. And you know, when I when I first reached out to you, that I'm I'm always interested to hear what is happening in the South African landscape mm. through a business lens. And I think what came out in the news that everyone is very aware about is what what you did with Edgar's in 2020, when retailability actually acquired Edgar's. Well, you know, a, a portion of it, but most of it. And yeah. to date, I've heard some wonderful things in terms of how your team and yourself have really turned the business around. And I think just to give the li- listeners a, um, a bit of context here, Retailability acquired Legit in 2017. And uh, in one of your interviews, I think it was the MoneyWeb interview, you mentioned that you had a lot of learnings from the Le- Legit acquisition that you implemented and, and really utilized within the Edgar's one. So for you, what were those lessons that you really wanted to, to, to take home and, and execute from? Yeah, thanks, Grant. I mean, I, I think um, the, the the biggest difference, I mean, let me, let me start there. The biggest difference between the legit transaction and the Edgar's transaction was that the Edgar's transaction came out of business rescue. Um, and and what, what we didn't fully understand or appreciate was uh, the, the, the extent to which that affected customers' perception of the business. Uh, you know, we anecdotally, we still have some customers saying to us, oh, is Edgar still open? Um, I, I didn't know, you know, and, it, and it's a bit rude to ask them, you know, what rock they've been hiding under um, or what shopping malls they choose not to go to. But, 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 the, but that's the reality is that when you, when you buy a business out of business rescue, it has had an extended period of bad press. And ultimately, it's got to business rescue because of a number of issues on a generally on a mismanagement basis, you know, so the management team, as good as they may have been or whatever they were, were dealing with other issues other than the consumer in the period leading up to business rescue. You know, there were other challenges that they had to face. So uh, I think for us, the biggest learning out of the Edgar's transaction was uh, possibly discounting the size of the effort required to reestablish a positive image behind the Edgar's brand. That was probably the the, the biggest okay. challenge that we had to overcome. Um, from a from a, a learnings perspective, uh, gee whiskers. Uh, however hard you think it is, it's like building a house. You know, it, it never goes it never goes according to plan, and it's never delivered on time. Um, so, however, however, whatever you think your budget is, double it. You know, whatever your effort level you think it is, double it. You know. Um, it's not for the faint heart, but but what a ride. So if if we were to look then also at what you've done with Edgar's, I mean, I've walked as an example, you know, um, I've actually gone into the Edgar's in four ways more, and I've noticed that on the one side, it's it's far more visible. So for example, from just me walking past now, I can see what is happening, yeah. what is inside, at, at, you know, yeah. at that level within Edgar's. And to, in my mind, what you've created within there and what your team has created are like micro experiences within now the Edgar's environment. Talk to me a bit about how you've managed to revamp the Edgar's side of things. And I think maybe just to give you um, another context here, we see a lot of retailers, you know, creating, I quote, their next gen yeah. stores. Yeah. And in actual fact, what they've just done is just painted it yeah. a new color, you know, changed the font, a little bit of the signage. But from what it looks like in the Edgar's environment now, it looks like you have fundamentally shifted the, yeah. the actual experience of that store. So maybe just talk a bit about the practicality. There. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest cancer in, in retail in particular is, is one of 
um, when things get tough, it's time to rebrand. Um, and, and we believe that rebranding will reposition us in the hearts and minds of the consumer and change our fortunes forever. Um, a new logo isn't a silver bullet. Um, and, and in actual fact, we, we, spent, the, we spent the first uh, 12 months of the turnaround. We, we didn't spend one rand on marketing, not one rand. Because I kept saying to the Oaks, you're going to go until customers come in and see the same thing you've always seen. That's not a sales pitch for a turnaround. That's not living the strategy of what we try to do. So all our energy, instead of trying to spread, you know, uh, your power too thinly across all the different facets of functions within a business, we really narrowed our focus. So we said to ourselves, what are the three or four, and we called it the big five, to have a bit of an African flavor. So what are the big five initiatives that are going to shift us um, and, and shift the dial dramatically from a sustainability of the business and really aligning it to the reality of the African consumer. Uh, the, you know, and, and I keep, and I talk to that because we, we're not just in South Africa, we, we're in a, in a number of countries around Southern Africa. So how do we, how do we, how do we do that? And we, we sat back and we said, okay, well, firstly, your big box format, big boxes are notoriously hard to navigate and get around. And there was even consumer feedback that said, you know, we, we can't we can't see what's what's in and around the store. So so <laughs> I don't know too many people who sell stuff without showing it. Uh, you know, you, you you can't do that, right? So like sell a car but don't show people, you know. It might have worked a little bit for the DeLorean, but but it didn't really last long, did it? So 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 that's the that's the one piece. So we wanted to lift visibility. And the second thing is, is that we had to realize that in, in our market, you need to have the right value equation. So it's the fundamental. What is the quality, price, and fashionability ratios and mix that you want to see it right? And I felt that the group had become too reliant on brands and hadn't really focused on fashion for the South African market. So, so we, we shifted our focus from a product perspective. We shifted our pricing strategies. Uh, we lifted the visibility in the stores. I mean, we haven't spent like bucket loads of money in, in the, inside the environment yet. I mean, we started to migrate, um, but you can't do everything, you know. So, so, so we picked those. We picked those buckets. We realized that a lot of the stores had very little stock, so we had to get the stock balancing right from the smaller store to the bigger store in volume. Um, and we worked hard to get the beauty customer back into Edgar's because um, that was always such a pillar of of, of that brand. So pick the five big things um, and then, and then uh, maybe, maybe this is a little controversial, but I, you know, I, I literally behaved like a dictator. You know, this is all I'm going to talk about for the next 18 months. Don't, don't bring me anything else. Focus on that. Do this, do that. Consistently execute it. Make sure that the habit forms. Um, the, the, one of the learnings out of the legit transaction was that just because you've ticked the box and you've changed something on a piece of paper it doesn't mean it changes on the store and stays changed. Um, so it's uh, you know that reinforcement, reinforcement till it becomes a habit. Um, and and uh, I mean that's ultimately all we've done for for three years. Now, geez, actually been three years. But for me, what's standing out here, uh, like what's standing out here, is very much on the along the lines of you know you you use the the term um, you know dictator. But at the end of the day. What you're saying there in substance is that you walk the walk like it had to be you and it had to be yeah. your management team that really created consistency and a disciplined approach to really just focusing on a handful of outcomes that yeah. you wanted to achieve. Because as you probably experienced, as I and anyone listening has experienced, a lot of the time there's about um, 12 to 20 different what someone would term strategic yeah. objectives that, that, that typically come from the the typical consultant in terms of selling their time. And, and, and that actually con causes a tremendous amount of confusion um, and distraction from, you know, from what I've observed, both in kind of the, the yeah. corporate environment when I did my articles, as well as now in other well, SMBs, more to medium That's businesses. right. I mean, you, you, so, I mean you, uh, yeah. how many comp companies genuinely have resources to fully execute 20 strategies? But I mean, I sat in an EdCon strategy where there was one and a half pages of strategic initiatives, each of which will take more than a year to be able to implement. Very few organizations have that kind of capability skill set within the leadership team 
mental margin in their daily jobs to be able to actually focus on it, as well as cash to be able to execute these things. You just you just can't just can't do it. So what happens is you end up half pregnant, partially executed on you know twenty different initiatives, and then you get no value, but you've spent all your money. Uh, and, and I think uh, what what's often not appreciated is uh, sometimes. So, so I'll tell you, it's, it's like we're all part of the team together. Every function, whether it be HR, marketing, financial services, uh, you know, club management, merchandise, buying, planning, finance, IT. So everybody's got to have a strategic initiative. But why? Why? You know, because sometimes in a, in in a, in a team environment, this is my year to play a supporting role. Next year is my year to try and, you know, to, to potentially have my opportunity for my next step change within my business. So we're so desperate to have everybody feel like they're part of this big strategic initiative where the reality of business is its evolution. It's not a metamorphosis. So how do you evolve in a structured and controlled manner that you don't blow the bank balance, you fully execute, and you keep progress over a five-year period? It's always this Hail Mary. You've got to turn this thing in a year. That's delusional, man. Uh, you know, it, just, it just doesn't happen. So what are the big things that has the biggest impact? And that's where we put our energy. Um, so marketing, HR, those guys didn't have st strategic initiatives in the first 18 months. You know, um, the, you know, the biggest drive for HR team was we called it internal marketing. You know, just keeping the dipstick of positive energy going, you know, and how's it doing? Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's it. That's a supporting role, you know, and it was a critical role. Um, every now and again, we forget to say, well done, you know, when you're in such a, like a task orientated mode. If we actually jump a bit to the yeah, theory yeah. side quickly, because I think this is one that, that people really use interchangeably in terms of these two <clears throat> words is strategy mm. and a plan. And a lot of people now have combined, unfortunately combined the two and said strategic plan, which for me, I think is just ludicrous. And for you though, before, I mean, I've got my, you know, definition of a strategy versus a plan, but for you, what is that key distinction between a business having a strategy and then a business having a plan or multiple plans? So, so for me, it's, I mean, and, and um, there's a book called Playing to Win and I'm a big fan of it. Um, so if anybody wants to read it, they must, they must read it. Um, but it is, it's unbelievably, uh, you know, clear for me when you, when you get through that, but strategy for me is what is my place in the world? So I have to have relevance. So that is my point of relevance. That is my place in the world. And this is how I differentiate relative to my peer set. So that carves out my place. That's a strategy. You should be able to get that down on a page. You know, if you can actually have that kind of clarity of, of, of where you stand where you want to play. That, that's that's my one pager. Then I'm going to sit and say, okay, well, how far off is my current business operations model and and way of doing business from allowing me to achieve that, that place in the market? The biggest gaps are the areas you've got to go and hit. So, so in the Edgar's environment, we really wanted to be a broad-based South African fashion and beauty retailer. Two pillars, fashion and beauty. That's what we're building our business behind. Everything else is an enabler behind that. And I wanted to be a value retailer. I couldn't be a niche retailer. Why? You've been to four ways. That store's 10,000 squares. How do you run a niche boutique 10,000 square meter store profitably? You can't. So, so I had to broaden the market appeal. Okay, so I want to be a broad-based fashion, beauty, value business in the South African context while providing a nice balance between private label fashion and brands, international brands. That, that, that's high level, really, what I want to be in, where I want to play. And there's a little bit of nuances inside that that's, that's, that's quite cool to, to keep private. Um, and, and, then, and then we say, okay, well, let's look at what we're doing in Edgis. Okay, well, three quarters of the store is full of brands. Okay, so where's the value in the private label business that'll broaden the appeal. Um, then I look at the fashionability and I say, geez, like guys, that, the, the average mom and dad won't wear any of that stuff. So you're buying the wrong product, 
you're charging too much for it because they got to spend money on kids because they just uh, you know that you lose your hair and you they absorb your cash um but they're so rewarding and and then and then you say to yourself okay on that basis guys we we're missing the value equation so we put 12 percent deflation into our business year one to get that right then we said okay and we're missing the fashionability core now fashion life cycle is nine to 12 months for you to be able to start to bring the change of product based on your supply chain. So then we're saying, okay, cool. So we've got to start getting that right. So we'll only really see the fruits of our hard work in nine to 12 months time from a product perspective. So we built that plan and we understood the timeline behind that. And I think that's the difference. Strategy, boom, position, plan is what are the things you're going to go and change? What are the metrics that you're going to use to try and understand whether you're shifting it? I can quote my deflation. I can quote the number of options I shifted in my business. Uh, I know that 40% of the range goes down to bottom stores. No more. If you if you go to a big Edgar store like Four Ways, you will see 100% of the range. If you then go and pop to Key West, uh, just on the West Rand around the corner from there, you're going to only see 40 to 45% of the range because of the size. So we went and tiered it so we can get some profitable profitability out of our stock chain. So, so each of those different buckets we went in and built, and then we understood the timelines behind it. Because otherwise, every quarter I sit in a board meeting and they're looking at me saying, where's the turnaround? Um, I'd have a meeting with the landlord and he would say, we're a bit concerned about your turnaround. And it's like, it's been three months. You know, you, your expectations on me are way too high. You know, you must chat to my wife. So, so it, it's you know, she, she'll help you know, you know, tell you the truth, man. I'm a disappointment. So, so it, it's these little, it's it's that clarity on timeline up front, understanding that it's whatever plan you put in is going to be wrong on the day you write it. But at least it sets expectations. Um, you know, miracles happen in Walt Disney. Eh? Hard graft happens in real world. I think what what you've shared now in terms of that difference between strategy and and plan if if i can take a stab then at from our research yeah. on retailability and what you've been doing and you know the multiple brands that mm. you're running um, for me what what is coming across as a constant is the fact that you have really invested time money and expertise within the supply side of the business in such a way where you can truly um kind of merge all of the purchasing power and the logistical um, process of moving product to um, to stores. And you've done it in such a way where it's super cost effective. And then it's also allowed you to generate quite a lot of insights when it comes to, you know, demand yeah. planning and so on across these stores. And together then with the fact that you, now you have a strong supply um, positioning to then offer true value to these particular, let's call them your internal customers like Edgar's and, and Legit and, and, and now the rebrand Swagger. If you were to now think then the next entry that you've done is you've kind of merged those brands together in, in ways that they do complement, like bringing Keto mm, into mm. Edgar's, you know, that gives Keto a huge amount of retail space that it wouldn't necessarily have and gives Edgar's then, you know, another diversification. Yeah. Together then with the fact that because most of Edgar's in the past was everything to no one in the context of like them not having their own brands that they could really kind of yeah. control that um, that focus when it comes to the value for customers, you brought the private labeling into Edgar's now. So yeah. um, I hope yeah. I'm in the right yeah. direction. My research was a bit aligned. Um, but for me now, if you were to think then at, a, at the strategy that you've positioned mm. retailability, Ultimately, what this means then is that if there is an opportunity down the line for another, either a brand or yeah. slash a retailer, you have that sufficient positioning now, especially from a supply side and, and, and the proprietary platforms that you've created to serve it, you can actually take them and, and bring them onto this platform that yeah. you've created um, to help them with the focus and then of course the the control yeah i mean i, I mean i think i think that's spot on so uh, before the legit transaction uh what's that 20 2017 um we was we, i mean we we had a hundred store business um two brands and we were like okay it, it was at that stage we called it a, a david goliath type uh, acquisition you know buying something bigger than yourself um and, uh, you know, I, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, geez, that all, that's like a once in a lifetime. 
little did they know in 2020 we'd do it again. But, uh, you know, <laughs> why make life easy? Um, but, 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 but at that time, we were sitting saying, okay, well, uh, our objective was always to be bigger. So there was always this little dream of, hey, look, we're a small business. We want to stay small, but be big, you know, and, and, and kind of get all the, let's call it the safety and security of a bigger balance sheet, you know, in time and a bigger business. It really does, it does provide uh, a lot of defense in tough market environments and tough trade environments and so on. Uh, and, you know, small businesses are always, always more exposed. It's, it's the nature of the beast uh capitalism um so 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 ultimately we were sitting and saying okay well if we're going to be growing aggressively we need to have a back end that is scalable um, so so we said to, so we sat down and we said okay there's three things that we needed in a retail back end so we call it it's kind of like if you follow BAPSIM, it's called the triangle so it's your supply chain it's finance and it and and that back end this all the stuff the customer doesn't see that's the piece that we said there's three words that wanted to define everything we wanted. We had to be robust. Um, we used the example of you need to be able to throw it down the stairs and the point of sale still works. You know, you, you, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we've got stores in remote locations where, uh, you know, we have to have um, the computers dusted uh, every six months because of the volume of dirt and dust that floats around the air, you know. So, so it has to be incredibly robust. Um, it needed to be phenomenally simple, um, not just because I'm reflecting on who's going to be using the equipment, the systems, and the supply chain, but but really, if if it's if it's simple, it's replicatable, it's easily understood, and the guys on the ground can take ownership. Um, and that's that's really what you actually want in life. You know, you just if the guys doing the job can take ownership, it's a win. It takes pressure off. Um, and it had to be super cost effective, um, so in that way scalable as well. Um, so, so we went onto an IT platform that it's incredibly easy, incredibly cheap to add new stores. Um, and then we went and we built a distribution center um, uh, before it got burnt down. Um, but and then we built it again. But but you know we, we love building DCs. Uh, we got really good at it. So so we you know we built one that. We don't have to worry in the next five to 10 years, it can deal with the volume. And it's like a Meccano set. So the bigger I get, I can pull some cash aside. I can go and buy some more racking. I can go buy a new extender belt. Um, so you it's it's you don't even have to spend all the money up front. You can, you can actually grow slowly with yourself. It actually becomes a self-funding exercise. Um, and, and then we looked at our finance team and said, okay, guys, you're going from doing uh, 10,000, transactions a month to doing 30,000 transactions a month, doing 300,000 transactions a month. So you start, the volume is just a killer, you know? Um, so how are you going to do your reconciliations? You know, how are you going to reconcile cash? How are you going to track all the, the merchant acquiring transactions and map it back and the finance systems and the payroll, you know, we, we went from a thousand staff and we now sit on 9,000 staff, you know, that's a different, different payroll, you know? So it's, it's build, go into platforms that aren't necessarily the biggest and the best, but are scalable in an affordable manner. That was, that was our modus operandi. Um, so we don't have the, the, all the famous, you know, the, um, you know, we can talk about SAP, right? Everyone who's done a SAP integration. Is quite surprised. <laughs> I was just going to mention Spark. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So. No, no, no. I mean, shame. <laughs> I've got friends there at, at, at Spa. So, like, I don't want to rub it in too much. But, you know, That's anything real. that begins yeah. with an S, you got to be careful, you know. Um, you know, and, and, I've, and I've been with the Oracle, you know, I've, I've been down the Oracle Road. Uh, I mean, they are phenomenally powerful systems. They are amazing. But the resources you need to be able to do it is for a different size business, you know. Um, and, and we weren't that. Um, so so mid tier, robust, scalable, cheap. You know that's the the guys that work tease me. I've got a brand. It's called CLM, cheap like me. Uh, you know, it's like how do you make how do you make those pennies really work for you? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and and you know, for me, if I use, use an analogy, yeah, it's almost like retailability is. It reminds me of Toyota, where you've you, you've created this chassis, and um, you know you can have a Toyota Hilux on top, or you can actually have a Toyota Fortunate, yeah. depending on you know the type of um, you know kind of 
distance that you want to travel or kind of experience or journey that you want to, you know, go on. So for me, I definitely think Edgar's, you know, versus legit and so on. Like it's fundamentally on the same chassis, but, but you've yeah. designed it in a particular way where it's customer kind of focused <laughs> yeah. now, or at least, you know, moving in that. So you only differentiate on the front end. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree with that then. And I mean, let's then talk practically around the people side now, because at a macro level, we, we hear a lot about these types of strategies that, that, that especially retailers, you know, are going through and trying to execute. But practically speaking now, you're employing, you know, or, or I think you saved from the Edgar side directly and indirectly. I think it was around 8,000 jobs um, as a consequence of your acquisition. And for you, how, how do you make sure that you gain buy-in from the, the, the cashier to the packer to how do you make sure that, you know, you can actually gain buy-in from the team? What practically yeah. are you doing uh, with, you know, your broader teams um, and tools or systems that you're implementing to gain that buy-in? And I know it takes time, but what, what did that kind of look like when you did that yeah. turnaround? I mean, it's probably the same that you did with the and Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Kido is a benefit of it. It was, uh, it was a good business that needed a new home. Um, so that was that was quite a bit easier. I mean, the Edgar's piece for, w- was a lot tougher. I mean, the guys had gone through a period of insecurity in their jobs, um, and I don't I don't care how mentally robust anybody thinks they are. If your job's on the line, you you wobble, you know, and you bring it to work and you take it home, and you got family members saying to you, "What are you going to do?" Um, so, so, and, and then you got, you got lunch breaks in stores where all you can talk about is why the shelves empty. How do we sell anything? We're never going to make targets. So, so those are the kind of, that's the environment that you come, you know, you come into when you take a business out of business rescue. You know, that's what I said right in the beginning is don't ever discount our, you know, if, if you, if any of your listeners or anybody who listens to this wants to go into a, a business rescue transaction, just prepare yourself mentally for that. The, the, the people side of the business um, that you got to dig into. Um, so so what, what we really wanted to do is we wanted to very quickly make it obvious to every single staff member that there was a plan and not just that there was a plan, but that they could start to see the fruits of that plan. So, uh, you know, I can tell you words uh, of this is what I'm going to do and that's what I'm going to do. And I mean, we live in a country where that's quite prevalent. Uh, but then you don't implement it, um, and then you start to not trust the words, um, and, and that's that's uh, that goes back to the values of the business. So we 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 really laud the principle of honesty. So don't say anything you're not going to do. Uh, you, you don't need to pander to anybody. So we said to the guys, we know your stores are empty, and they said, good because they are. So he knows something we see. Tick. Then we said, we are going to go and buy 900 million rands more stock to fill the stores. And that's what we had to do. So then they say, okay, wow, there's going to be a lot of stock coming. Yes. And then we made sure that when we made those statements, we already had stock lined up. And they started seeing boxes coming in. And when you start seeing boxes at the in the receiving area in stores, they start saying, why are they going to bring in stock if we're going to lose our jobs? That doesn't make sense. This is, this is good news. And then they started seeing how cheap the stuff was relative to what it was. And they could start affording some of it. Guys, this is nice product. Look at the price. Lots of it's coming in. Management are doing what they say. And and uh, you know, I hate that term, but but that's, you know, the guy, you know, it's, let's start deliver on those promises. And when you do that consistently, month two, three, four, five, six, and by the time you get to month 18, they start saying to you, you know, What's next? You know, like, uh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Um, and, and I think it's that kind of credibility that we built up very quickly over time. Um, and then, the, and then the second, the second uh, bucket that we looked at was, you know, we we feel that a business that comes out of business rescue is one that generally needs a lot of emphasis on customer experience. Um, and that was that was the fifth of our big five initiatives is we had to improve the customer experience um, because that's how you know if something's different. Um, and and we, we created a bit of a, a customer experience initiative. We called it Customer First Program. Um, 
and and behind that we put training and competitions and and, and engagements and videos we staff sent us yeah. videos of them doing stuff not us feeding them they fed us you know and 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 we that level of engagement uh, definitely starts to starts to pay dividend and then we say to them as part of this customer first is not just rhetoric because most of these schemes they're like they come up you know, no offense to agencies, but agencies will come up with these great ideas and present this thing to you. And there's Raz Matez and John, you know, Bon Jovi will be the lead singer and in the, the introduction. And you're know, like a Walmart thing from Walmart, you know. And, and you and, and and you just look at this and you're saying, it doesn't feel authentic, you know. Um, so so I was adamant it had to be authentically South African uh, in terms of uh, what we wanted to drive, which generally meant it was real and simple. Um, real simple, and then, and then uh, we said, let's back it up with changing what the staff see day in and day out inside their store. So we said, okay, guys, we want to put the customer first. What are the customer touch points? Fitting rooms. So we spent money fixing all the fitting rooms across all the stores. It's not a lot of money, but it's a mirror, it's a bench, it's a hook, it's proper lighting, it's neat, it's tidy, respectful. Great. That's the one touch point. Then the second touch point that all customers go through, well, the ones that, that give us some of their cash, is the cash desk experience. So we said, okay, let's go and upgrade all the cash desks. And we did that. We went through every single store. We made the cash desk neat, tidy, pretty, put some TVs, a little bit of communication, fixed up us, you know, the queues, uh, the queue posts out, you know, next to it, and we upgraded that piece. So you're saying, okay, those are strategic touch points. You know, you, you spoke about visibility. Uh, when you go into a store and it's dark, uh, you know, you know, dark, dark, dark halls are good for certain things, you know, teenagers, not for shopping. So so what we needed to be able to do was say, okay, guys, you need to be able to show the product. So we upgraded all the lighting in all the stores. Yes, great initiative, LEDs, save electricity, reduce your carbon footprint. Those are all good things. But customers can also see the product now. You know, and, and and that's a customer experience piece. So we ticked lighting, fitting rooms, cash desk, biggest touch points. Um, and then the staff saying, geez, look, this looks better. That's nice. They're following through on this. Well, then I'm going to put more of an effort to greet customers. You know, I'm going to interact more with customers. I'm going to help redirect them and show them what else. Um, I'm going to try and sell some stuff. Uh, and then, you know, for, lastly, the, the T of, of first is thank the customer. It's a weird thing, you know. People appreciate thank yous, so so it's 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 that kind of very simple but powerful stuff, um, you know. And, and it's 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 interesting as a South African culture, we tend not to always be extroverted. So sometimes engaging with uh, for a staff member to engage with a customer coming in is sometimes a tricky thing, you know. It's whether it be cultural or whether it be uh, you know confidence with language. It's, it's tricky. So, so we've gone and we said, okay, in the front of every store, we've employed somebody who meets and tidies up the front of the store, but their, their core purpose is to say hello to people. So just say hello as people come in. And it seems like such a weird, simple thing. But, you know, we get, we have customer service scores now where um, mystery shoppers go and they give us scores. We, we're hitting over 90% on the friendly greeting score. So at least you start with a friendly hello. Everything after that, we try and do better, but at least we're starting on the right foot, you know, and that's that's all we can ask for at this stage. Norman, I think you know what you've shared now. I, you know, I have a view that we can we can never empower someone else, but we can create the environment to enable them to empower themselves. And you know, I call it the, the three elements: it's um, space, both physical and psychological, making sure that that you know is. Is, is conducive for them um, feedback yeah. right in terms of what yeah. you're sharing now I mean just the fact that they can actually communicate you know with management yeah. or communicate in such a way where there's a feedback yeah. loop um, you know I think that that's massive and then of course what I call tools and systems and you know you you tangibly you know linking that to feedback and so on and and for me the the biggest takeaway here then is very much of the fact of make sure that everything is as tangible as yeah. quick as possible, even if it is changing the fitting rooms. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a massive financial exercise. And I think you just demonstrating now that it has to be as 
practical, as tangible as possible, as quick as possible, is 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 pervasive across any type of business. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're doing uh, five million or you know five billion a year. This this is something that has to happen across every single business. Yeah, it, it's pride, hey. Eh? So you know, it's hard to be proud in something when you feel ignored. So if if you don't if if you don't uh, if you got dirt on the side of the roads and litter everywhere, it's like, well, nothing stops somebody else from throwing something else because on the floor, because it's all there. So the investment, whether it be on a factory shop floor, you know, appropriate investment and not reckless stuff, you know, you, you don't need to give things that people don't need, but just those glimmers of improvement over time, uh, just starts to drive a different level of pride. And why, how can I look at a staff member and I say, I expect you to try and sell stuff for me. Um, and why aren't you delivering on your promise? And why aren't you hitting your target? And why aren't you, when they don't ever see evidence of the work that we're putting in. Um, so, so I think it's just about making our commitment real and setting that example. If you look at, let's call it the layers of communication that you have now in retailability. You know, I, I, I did my articles at Pick and Pay and, you know, you know, right now that they're struggling and, and, and kind of from what I saw there, you know, kind of it's, it's clear uh, with what has happened and what is, um, hmm. you know, going to be the focus points going forward. But the layers of communication and retailability, just describe that to me a little bit, because how many layers are between you and then the cashier as yeah. an example? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, pr practically there are there are quite a few layers, you know, from from me to shop floor, but they're less than what they would be in probably ninety percent of my. And I'm going to use the word corporate peers. Um, so, so we do operate on a very flat structure. Uh, you know, we always tell people it's a sign of our cost uh, cost control, uh, and, and 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 in some ways that's true, but it's also equally reflective of both my excessive compulsive nature to always want to know what's going on in the detail. But but also, uh, the closer you get your decision makers to the shop floor in a retail environment, the better decisions you make around what to buy, where to spend money, um, and, and, and what promotions, what to do next. Uh, so, so how do you stay out the detail, but then be the person that people come to you for advice on what to do, but you don't know what's going on? You know, you, it, it's... Your, your decisions are going to be flawed. Um, and then what happens is, is you start shifting into uh, theoretical MBA speak as opposed to just bare bones, simple retail speak. Um, and, and, and I think the likes of the pick and pays and, and a couple of other groups out there that need to reflect on, you know, how, uh, when, when did we stop focusing on retail and selling, buying and selling stuff? You know, I always say, what do you, Alex told me, what do you do for a living? And I'll buy and sell stuff. Um, and, 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 and I love it, you know, and, and every now and again, we get it right and we sell it for more than we bought it for. Um, and, and, and I hear that's a good thing. So, 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 so it's, it's very much on that. So, so we, we have very flat structures. So, uh, I don't really, I don't have a two, I see, uh, the merchants, the merchant heads, the ops heads, they all report directly through, through to me. Uh, they all got buying and planning teams, the, uh, ops guys, each have an area managers, that report into them and those area managers each have around 10 to 12 stores that they got to look after uh, edgar's will only have about seven stores and that allows them to um really get into the detail and manage their own business units uh, you know appropriately um, and then it's the store staff you know so it's it's not a massive hierarchical struggle uh, structure uh, mm. which allows for quick response, better flexibility, more in the detail, uh, and, it, and it lives with our entrepreneurial nature. Um, we always find ways to try and make things work, yeah. not the other way. Yeah, I read Whitey, I read Whitey yeah, Besson's book, and, uh, you know, he, I mean, I, I'm in awe of what he and his team did. Um, but the, the one thing that Whitey mentions is that there was always a maximum of five, five layers between him and everyone. And um, it's, it's an interesting, you know, especially at a size where they're the, 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 the number one in private employer yeah. in our country. It's incredible how there's, you know, only five, you know, around five. Maybe it's different now with Peter, but um, it, it definitely looks like it's yeah. working, if you know what I mean, in terms of that decision making and quick decision making. Um, just lastly, Norman, before... 
before we head off and um, you know close this very very insightful chat with you, I think you you still have the thank you program yeah. at Edgar's, and there's over I think there's about twelve million kind of members or customers as part of that um, Shoprite checkers. They've got um, in the extra savings side of things, they've got uh, mm-hmm. seventeen million. So now I think they're the number one. They surpass yeah. Smart Shopper. For you, do you see that as 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 a huge opportunity? Like, just maybe un- unpack that for me a little bit. Yeah, uh, I, you know, look, I mean, I think any any opportunity to communicate directly with your customer is awesome. You know, um, I, and and I think it's it's to be valued. So so without a doubt. Uh, we didn't, we didn't push the thank you program too hard in the first, again, 12 to 18 months. In actual fact, 18 months, we did very little in it because it, it is, it is uh, when, 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 you're, when your fundamentals aren't right, again, I go back to my point. What am I going to tell the customer? Sign up for thank you and get loyalty points on stuff you don't want to buy. Uh, you know, it, it just, the, the, message, the messaging is wrong. Um, for me, uh, the ability to communicate directly with customers is is worth a lot. The points and discount is the cost of being of that privilege of being able to talk directly to customers. Um, and there are a lot of cool ways to, that you know, as technology is an advanced and thinking around loyalty and club and value add services as that grows, you can really layer this into the thank you program. We started to do that. Uh, with birthday vouchers, you know what? Are, what are cool things for customers? Your birthday is always cool, you know. Um, so, so let's talk to them about that. You know, our Edgar's Club scheme is still alive. Uh, we've got lots of members and a great program. You know, whether it be cheap flights, cheap accommodation, and so on. So, hey, why don't you join Club and get a discount because you're a thank you customer? You know, so it's it's all little ways for us to try and add value to that customer experience. Uh, with the primary goal of tailored communication, reducing the volume of spam, and having one-on-one engagement with the customer. So, so it's key. Hardest part of that, data management, without any shadow of a doubt. Uh, you know, when we onboarded the 12 million, little did we know that some customers' names were A-A-A-A-A-A, you know, um, you know, I don't know if they, oh, I don't want to give you my name. Um, or what it was, but but I mean, we, we, and then like uh, the number of cell phone numbers that were only five digits long, so so the data integrity is 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 a massive work stream, you know, and it's taken us nine months to cleanse all our data, um, but once you've got it and you get your input accurate and clean, you, you there's a lot of value.